wild and pure and forever free! Welcome back to the Mentorlet grind. This time we're playing Ninja and for full context I waited until about an hour after the daily reset on a Friday to see if it made any difference for the quantity of guild tests since clearly going warrior didn't change much. Looking at this duty happening in the background you would think I had bad news to report but overall good news everyone. If you like harder content in your mentor roulettes. Friday evening might actually be the way. With that said, for duty 1 we went to enemy parties. After waiting for the daily reset and sitting in queue for 5 minutes, there's not really anything to talk about. It's just enemy parties. For duty 2 we went to the Great Hunt Extreme with Rathalos. With 3 mentors and 1 healer sprout this should be a cinch. In fact, I would say we nailed this one. No one really got hit by any avoidable mechanics. Both I and the machinist each soloed our stack markers and the healer made extensive use of their toolkit to save our potions in phase 1 and then using Ishuna in phase 2. Just excellent and fun. Just to shine a light on the stack marker thing you can see how close to death I go as I solo the stacks while having a dot ticking and the machinist actually went even lower than that. For duty 3 we went to the Great Hunt Extreme again with the same healer. It turns out they had been spamming this duty to get the mount and they also stated they only need to go 5 more times to finish. From my perspective I had already accepted that doing Great Hunt Extreme 6 times in a row would be way more fun than 30 guild tests so all good by me. Knowing how much they had left also helped a bit to set expectations. This attempt though, I made a lot of mistakes and got hit by mechanics several times. Our tank seemed to prefer doing the stacks together so I did the same. It is a lot safer. For the times I got hit, two of them was getting swiped just barely by the tail and the last time was me getting fire breathed right as Rathalos went down on the ground for the last time. For duty 4 we went to under the wait timer after an 11 minute queue. Ugh. Okay. Was kind of funny when the tank pulled the boss all the way out to the very edge here but aside from that nothing happened. For duty 5 we went to the pool of tribute, Susano Extreme. I know this duty from farming the mount unsynced but I've actually never done it synced before so I wasn't sure which mechanics mattered although I had foggy memories of certain differences from the normal version. I admitted to my lack of knowledge and asked if any of the other mentors knew what to do and they said it was not that much different from normal. So let's talk about that. Like on normal he will sometimes just suddenly swipe the main tank with the tank buster. Also like on normal he will send one player to Narnia, AOE everything except the thin line on the arena and put a stack marker on the person in Narnia. Unlike normal he will sometimes cause bubbles to rise out of the arena momentarily which causes about half the rate to get a bubble debuff that is essentially acceleration bomb, the classic dice countdown mechanic. The way you resolve this is by not doing anything at all when the dice hits 0 which is done by not doing anything at all when the dice hits 1. By anything at all I mean stop auto attacking, stop casting, stop moving and drop your controller to the floor or move your hands away from the keyboard. Nothing. Otherwise you take massive damage and get a debuff making further lightning damage hurt more. He also has the Razen Kaikyo circle AOEs like on normal. He might do more stuff in phase 1 but he transitions to phase 2 when he hits 76%. Just like a normal a tank has to intercept the sword. Also like a normal there will be orbs that should be soaked so they don't explode on the raid. However also like a normal power creep has made it reasonably likely a group can just rush down the sword fast enough that this might not be relevant. Unlike normal the tank taking the sword gets a slashing debuff so the tanks have to rotate for the second slash. And this then leads to phase 3 which is also a bit different. Just a bit. The sword actually slashes a rift in the middle of the arena and weirdly you can walk over it. 
but you will die if you stand in it for too long. In this phase, he will regularly use Storm Splitter, which cleaves in the direction of the main tank and assuming it does damage, it applies a slashing resistance down debuff that requires a tank switch. He also regularly puts Leaven Bolt markers on random players. When they resolve, they do damage to everyone on the half of the arena the marker happens to be on, so if you get the marker, you go to the other side to protect everyone else. However, he can apply this marker and simultaneously stun the person with the marker, so everyone else has to go. Although in fairness, as you may have noticed, failing this mechanic isn't lethal. He also casts Yukehi for multiple raid whites like on normal. And finally, he also summons the rocks like he does on normal, with more rocks to shuffle with. When he actually decides to stun someone with Levin Bolt, he puts a very obvious beam over them and also announces it quite obviously. Now come it up, make way. This of course requires everyone else to move instead. Notably, if he makes the announcement, it means all of the upcoming Levin Bolts will do this. However, with all that said, I think this fight was very manageable, especially for an extreme, and we managed to reveal with Susano just once. An excellent group indeed. We also had a mount drop, and I think he dropped everything he could drop. For duty 6, we have a Dawn Trail normal raid boss. Jump to this timestamp to skip it. With that, we went to M1N, Black Cat. I had a lot of fun as a ninja on this one, despite leading with messing up my opener right out the gate by using Dokobori and Kunai Spain in the same weaving window, which is not how I would normally want to do it here. I did stick to my plan throughout and my burst seemed to work decently well with most of it staying in the debuff window. On that note, a particularly impressive feat I would like to highlight near the end of the fight was me using Tenji Jin and then accidentally missing a press on 10, so I accidentally start with Chi. Yet somehow I managed to recover and Ten Jin at the end getting Katon Suiton, so I only lost a Raiton rather than getting Hyoton Huton, which would have been much worse. Aside from that, the fight just went great. I was also particularly lucky with the timing of when Black Cat decided to smack me up. For Duty 7, I was a 1 minute replacement in World of Darkness, which is an interesting one to be a replacement in. I got to watch Angra Mainyu. For the second boss, the incredibly creatively named 5 headed dragon, it has two particular mechanics I would like to highlight for anyone that might find it helpful. The first one is the Dragon Firefly. It spawns and then tethers to a random player. Over its duration it will attack whoever it is tethered to like five times I think. Each hit does a considerable amount of damage and applies a debuff that both reduces your max HP but also increases damage taken. Most DPS and healer jobs will die even from full HP from a hit while having about two stacks of this debuff. The intended solution is that you pass around the tether so no one takes two hits in a row. An alternative solution is to just pass it off to an off tank. With a bit of healer help they can take all of the hits. But the important part is that you don't just flee with the tether and die off in a corner. The other mechanic to watch out for is when the boss puts this swirly marker over someone. It means, in a few seconds, the boss will turn and fire a large circle AoE on the player suddenly, and this AoE knocks everyone in range into the air. The intended solution is to get that player away from everyone else as best you can. Alternatively, if that player isn't moving, you can also just flee. For Cerberus, I decided for once to not go in the belly. Obviously, I'm not even in Alliance B, right? Just to take note of what can go wrong on the outside in the meantime. I've heard stories of how bad it can get. I spent my time engaging some of the planned ads, which is no major issue, and just smack the doggo around. Eventually, all of Alliance B also managed to get in the belly, so my help was never needed. Anyway, finally for the last boss, I found it extremely funny that the boss becomes untargetable exactly here as my burst was starting. For duty 8, I was a 12 minute replacement in Ramu Extreme, but I enter and see only two players. The mentor tank explained that they were also a replacement. The sprout didn't really explain what went wrong, so my best guess is that they tried once and wiped and then people started leaving, and this player just hoped people would come back. 
I really wish this would have ended up working, but we sat there for a good 7 minutes and all we saw was like 3 players filter in and instantly leave when they saw Ramu Extreme and an unfilled party. Personally, I don't think Ramu Extreme is that bad, but I understand many groups have trouble with him, and that's okay. Ultimately, I suggested we vote Abandon, mainly to save the Sprout from this hell they had put themselves in. I believe they would have had a better chance of getting this done with a full fresh group than trying to refill this one, unfortunately. For duty 9, we go to an optional level 100 Dawn Trail dungeon. Use this timestamp to skip it if you prefer. That said, we went to Tender Valley. A very nice run. I always find Ninja far more difficult to play in dungeons due to a combination of the stopping and starting, the varying target counts and then suddenly a boss fight with proper rotation opportunities. All this has a tendency to cause me to drift certain cooldowns out of order. The addition of Kunai's Bane, making Trick Attack AoE relevant in Dawn Trail, has made this easier for me though. Overall, I think it went super well. For Duty 10, we have one more Dawn Trail raid boss. Jump to this timestamp to skip it if you like. That said, we went to M2N and wow, I did not do super well on this one. Overall, I managed to keep my rotation running with nothing major going completely wrong in that aspect. However, at one point, I managed to get both myself and the Reaper killed because I just could not wait one more second before using Forked Raiju. I of course owned up to my mistake immediately. Later still, I decided to use Limit Break 3 at just the wrong time, where really I should have just spent the time to scoot to the right before using it. This alone didn't kill me, but the confusion that came from it led to me dying again. Definitely not my strongest showing. And finally for Duty 11, we have A4N against the Manipulator in Alexander. Early on, while one of the healers soaked the exploding orbs, they supposedly quote Cider Spider, they said. Anyway, out of context, the thing they said could sound very rude, so they corrected it. I thought it was a little nice exchange. Anyway, moving on. Right as I prepare for my one minute burst and prepare Suiton, the boss becomes untargetable, exactly long enough for me to lose my ninjutsu. I was so shocked I didn't even bother to summon a bunny. So then I try again, losing that one ninjutsu, and right as I'm getting back in the swing of things, I get yoinked away for an ad phase. After we get back, normally Manipulator only has one mechanic left up its sleeve that can actually be a problem, and wouldn't you know it, our healers and two of our DPS are very closely stacked, leading to Judgment Nizi getting spread, both colors, on all four of them, immediately killing them, which turns this fight that seems to already be in the bag into a bit of a DPS race. For those unaware, the way this mechanic works is that each healer is given a Judgment Nizi debuff. One gets a blue one, the other a red one. They effectively do the same thing. Anyone that comes near to a player with either of the Nizi debuffs will also receive the debuff. And if you manage to collect both debuffs, then you die immediately. Now, the way this usually goes horribly wrong is if both healers are already next to each other when the debuff is applied, well, then they and anyone near either of them instantly die. So. The best solution to this mechanic is making sure the healers are never too close at any point in the fight to be on the safe side. When this mechanic is coming up, it is also a great idea for everyone else to step away from the healers to be extra sure, otherwise you just have a chain. Now, we still managed to get it done without wiping, but that certainly got scary. This time, we had a much more varied set of duties, and the only thing I changed was doing the roulettes on a Friday evening. Based on my recent experiences, it seems like that matters a lot more than which role you play, considering I still got a ton of guild tests on Warrior for example. With that said, with the extremes, Altali looks a lot more interesting, although I guess I have to add a new category to the list. Now, that is all for this video, thank you so much for watching. If you would like to support me and my channel more directly, you can become a member like these wonderful people here. You can also alternatively support me through Ko-Fi, link in the description. You can also support the channel by letting the YouTube algorithm know by liking the video, leaving a comment, subscribing, sharing and hitting the bell to get notified when next I post a video. Fun fact, before Shadowbringers, ninjas generated their ninki from outer attacks rather than weapon skills.
The fact that most ninja weapons have a swing time of around 2.56 then meant, combined with Futon or today's increased attack speed trait, reducing it by 15%, that you would generate 5 ninki every 2.18 seconds or so. So you could use Hellfrog Medium or Bahava Chakra once per 22 seconds. Ain't that something? 